Amen. All right, so we have been studying some um, some kind of hot button issue topics. Uh, we got into a couple weeks ago a discussion of of how our culture is changing in regard to sexual sin. So we're going to continue that today. A um, couple of things just as we get started here. You know, um, one thing I was thinking about this week and praying about was, uh, you know, so the way I want to approach this is today, I want to look at these topics from a biblical point of view. I want to know what God says about it. And then as we move through those, I want to come back and then look at more of a practical. Uh, what, what does this really mean for you and me, and, and how do we approach that now? In that regard, sometimes, number one, these are sensitive topics, and I'll try to talk about it in the most delicate way I can. Um, you know, some of it's kind of hard to hear. Uh, it's not fun to talk about. So that's number one. So be patient with me and be merciful to me. And then uh, number two, let's be sensitive to each other's opinions. We're going to differ a little bit probably on, on our view of, of how to handle the practical side of it. And where it's not a biblical issue, and even in biblical issues, we need to be patient with one another. And, and, but where, especially where it's opinion, we need to be mindful of the fact that you and I, we seek peace. Even where we disagree, we can seek peace in those moments. So I want to keep that in mind. Uh, so let's, let's move into talking about this. So we, we talked about it kind of more from a holistic macro level um, in regard to just sexual sin in general. I want to look at some specific topics beginning today. Uh, I want to look at them in this order. Transgenderism or... Um, uh, you know, this idea of, of the fluidity of gender. Uh, secondly, homosexuality, and then fornication or sexual immorality. And we're going to backwards view that from a biblical standpoint. What, how does the Bible view each of those topics? And, um, and, and so I want us to look at that. And then we'll come back, like I said, and look at a practical kind of thought here. From two perspectives, I want to look at it from the practical side of how, how, what should the church's approach be to each of those, and then personally, in my day-to-day -day life, when I'm meeting people, how does that look in my day-to-day -day life? And, and so uh, we'll, we'll talk about each of those. So let's talk about transgenderism. Now, if we talk about that term, it may denote different things in our minds, but when you, you hear that term... Uh, what does it mean to you? Like, what, what does that elicit in your mind or thought process? Uh, we've recently heard a growing clamor about this issue, especially in regard to, uh, or at least I have, maybe, maybe you haven't, but my perspective is I have, especially in regard to children, this seems to be a growing uh, debate and issue. Uh, so, so let me first say, what does that mean when you hear that term? Do they not know what they are? Okay, do they not know what they are? It's, it's moving from your biological gender to another gender. Okay, and so there, one of the things I hear, uh, and I've heard people talk about, <laughs> is, is this desire to separate biological sex from the, what they perceive as psychological gender. And they try to make a differing... Um, uh, philosophy or or scheme of thought about those two things and and have have, have separated those two. Any other ideas pop into your head about when you hear that term, what does it say in your mind? And it may differ from other people, it's okay. Confused. Confusion. Um, that somebody's confused about about their gender, their sex. All right, so uh, you think about transgender, I mean, the term is kind of obvious when you think about, you break it down into its parts. Trans means to change, right? To transform. And then gender, well, what is gender? Well, gender is your, your sex, right? You're a man or you're a woman. 
And so there are some who, who, who put forward an idea that, that we can live on a spectrum of genders. It's not just one. It's not two. It, it's not three. It's like many more. Um, San Francisco recently uh, started uh, giving a, what's the word I'm for, um, a tax rebate or, 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 or added income for transgender individuals, and their list of transgender individuals was quite lengthy. I believe, and I could be wrong about the number, but it was like 70 different genders. And maybe more, but but they had a list. And then at the bottom, interestingly enough, the last number was what? Unspecified or other. <laughs> so not only did you have all those, but now you you put down what you think, and and, and so uh, to me is it, it, it's interesting how quickly this has evolved. I want to read to you an article. This is from 2016, but. I think it's still appropriate. This is from Project Express. Dave Miller wrote this. I just want to read a couple paragraphs. It's very short. Um, he says, For over 40 years, and like I said, this is 2016, a host of forces have worked vigorously to normalize homosexuality in American society, culminating in the U.S. Supreme Court infamous ruling that stipulated homosexual marriage as a constitutional right. These same forces have most recently turned their attention to transgenderism. So you kind of get there. Even in 2016, there began to be this kind of focus then on, on the idea of gender and, and is it fluid. Um, as, as is always the case, when human beings decide they want to pursue certain uh, behaviors that have always been considered deviant and illicit, particularly in God's sight, they will do everything possible to bully and intimidate the opposition. And he gives a cross-reference of Genesis 19.9, which is what? Sodom and Gomorrah, when, when, when the men came to the house of Lot and tried to force their way in. Um, they will do everything possible to bully and intimidate the opposition. A careful analyst of history... Uh, demonstrates that the tactics that have been used the past several decades to advance uh, sexual aberration in America are reminiscent of the propaganda schemes that have successfully transformed other societies, including, uh, he gives an example of Nazi Germany and other totalitarian regimes. Uh, For all the bombast, coercion, venom, and widespread ridicule marshaled by the, uh, by the left and directed against Americans who steadfastly remained unmoved in their conviction that homosexuality and transgenderism are immoral behaviors. It is refreshing and encouraging to hear the truth declared by credible scientists. In a special report titled Sexuality and Gender, Findings from the Biological, Psychological, and Social Sciences, Lawrence S. Meyer and Paul R. McEwen, McHugh divulge their startling findings. And so then he goes on to talk about some of the findings. I'll come back to that later. I don't want to deal with that now. But, but I just, the atmosphere of change has been there. And as Christians, the question we always have to ask is, what should our response be? And, and so I want to spend some time in the Bible here, as I said, and then, then we'll move into the practical. So let's look in Genesis chapter 1. And this idea of gender, is our gender fluid? Can we move between different uh, um, sexual natures? Now, um, we're familiar with this verse, I know, but let's read it just one more time. Genesis 1.27 so God created man in his own image. That's, again, talking about the spiritual nature of man. And then he talks about, uh, and he goes on to say, in the image of God he created him, male and female, he created them. So he moves from the spiritual to the physical. Where's the physical part? Well, male and female. That, 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 that's a, a direct kind of outgrowth of our physical flesh, right? God determines 
um, in creation, what, what will be gender-wise, uh, sexually-wise. Um, uh, later in Genesis 5 and verse 2, I'm going to move around a little bit at the beginning and then we'll take some time to discuss. But uh, again, Genesis 5 and verse 2, he reiterates this ideal. Male and female, he created them and he blessed them and named them man when they were created. Again, and what is he declaring there? Two, two genders. I, um, and not just any two genders, but a complementary two genders. Why was Eve created? As a helper, as someone to walk alongside Adam. And so there is a... Um, a in their creation, there is a similitude between these two different genders. They connect with one another. Um, that's why Eve was not created separately from the clay, but what? She was taken from the rib of Adam and created, unlike any other creation uh, of that day. Even the animals, are um, they have dimorphic Genders, right? They're two genders, but they weren't created one from the other, right? God created a male cow and a female cow, and and same with all the other things. But with man, He took from man and created woman, and um, and He created Eve, and so there is this matching pair. Um, I want to look at one more, and then we'll, we'll go to the New Testament in just a minute. But Psalm one thirty nine. Now, that was the beginning of creation, and he set that, that principle in motion. Does he continue to oversee that? Well, what does David say in Psalm 139? Another text you're probably familiar with. Um, 139 and verse 14. He writes, 139, 14, I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you. When he says frame, poetically, symbolically, what's he talking about? That's the body, right? That's, that's the frame. That's our, um, the, the, the substance of our body, the, the thing that houses our spirit. He says, it was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. All right, and so again, what's David speaking to? And there's more he'll have to say in that psalm, but... What's he speaking to? Well, the creation of his body for his soul. Mm -hmm. And that God is still involved in that process. There, there's a still touch of God in that. Um, so when he says that he created a male and female, what does that exclude? Anything else, right? He defines what it is. You're either male or you're female. Anything else would be what? Not made by God. Not made by God. A deviation from what God has set in motion. All right, um, that's not the way man was formed. Um, go to Matthew 19. Matthew 19. Again, Jesus reiterates the words of, of Genesis 1. We'll just read verse 4 there for right now. Genesis 19, 4. What does Jesus say? Have you not read that he... Where do you read it? Genesis chapter 1 and 2. Uh, have you not read that he who, who's the he? God. God. He who created them from the beginning made them what? 
male and female. Again, a dimorphic pair that are integrally designed to match one another. It's uh, two puzzle pieces being united together. Uh, different pieces, but yet each intricately interwoven into the other. And so again, this idea that, that there are two genders, and he defines that quite clearly. Um, again, in a discussion of uh, of the role of men and women in, in the church. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, we won't read the whole text there, but 1 Timothy chapter 2, you begin at verse 12, it gets into that. But one of the reasons he gives for the way God established the roles in church and in, in worship is what? Creation. Was creation. He relates it back to the created order. And so... Does the Bible give us any license for gender fluidity? No. It's actually pretty clear, isn't it? It sets up a dimorphic pair which are perfectly matched together. Any misuse of that would be what? A version of the law. A version of the law. A version of creation. Yeah, sin against creation. All right. And, and, and so this idea that gender is fluid is just not biblically accurate. Um, what about, does God give an expectation or have an expectation for how men and women represent their genders? I think this is interesting. Um, there has been a push and a fight to... Um, to to rid our, our society of even the appearance of difference um, between the genders. Um, it's called equality or feminism. Um, but one of the things that second wave feminism has really pushed is this idea there's no difference between men and women. Well, well what does the Bible have to say about it? So let's go to Deuteronomy 22. Deuteronomy 22. Somebody read verse 5. Deuteronomy 22, 5. A woman shall not wear anything that pertains to a man, nor shall a man put on a woman's garment. For all who do so are an abomination to the Lord your God. All right, so what's he speaking about here in the text? Try to imitate the other. Okay. And, and, and it's interesting, he, he doesn't just use the term sin or that it's a bad thing, but he actually uses the term it's an abomination. Now, doesn't that have a more powerful connotation to it than just talking about transgression? There's an added element there um, in regard to this. And so, I know we're not under the law of Moses, and I'm not trying to claim that. I'm just, from the perspective of the law of Moses, one of the things that God calls an abomination is, is when, uh, when one gender tries to, one person from, from a particular gender tries to take on the attributes of the other. That, that's not the created order of things. Um, Let's go to the First Corinthians eleven. First Corinthians eleven. And I want to begin reading at about verse eleven. Somebody read eleven through sixteen, please. First Corinthians eleven, eleven. It is proper for a woman, excuse me, is it proper for a woman to pray to God with her head uncovered? 
Does not even nature itself teach that if a man has a long hair, it is a dishonor to him? But if a woman has long hair, it is a glory to her, for her hair is given to her for a covering. But if one is inclined to be contentious, we have no other practice, nor have the churches of God. All right, so a couple of things stipulate here. Number one, Paul points out this is not something to argue and fight about. Right? And it's not a matter of law in the New Testament the, in regard to whether a woman should, should have her head covered, whether she should have short hair, long hair, whether a man should have short and long hair. And that's not really what I want to talk about. I want to note the principle, though, that's going on here. Why even speak about this? And again, I don't want to get into the head covering issue, but I want to look at the broader principle of what's going on. <laughs> yeah. What's the problem he's addressing? People follow after their own lust. I mean, okay. their own ways, not God. And he says, does not nature itself teach you? Mm -hmm. Going back to the concept of the order of things God put in place to begin with. They need to look What's like that? a man or a woman. Yeah, and, and again, that's exactly right. So he's getting back to this principle of there is a diversity in gender and you need to represent that. And again, it must have been an issue. Again, why would he bring it up if it's not an issue in Corinth that, that there was a, a kind of mixing of, of, of appearance in regard to the two genders? Again, does God have an expectation on us? Yes, absolutely. Now, is the expectation head coverings? No, and, and he points that out. He says, "Don't. We're not fighting about head coverings or whether men can have long hair or not." But it's a broader issue. It's on the macro level of uh, of this kind of fight to uh, to to mess, muddy up the waters in regard to gender difference, and that there is gender difference and. Um, and that God has a certain expectation about men need to behave like men, women need to behave like women, and not meld the two. Now, uh, I think one of the things that seems to confuse some of this is that all of us kind of exist on a spectrum. All right? And if I had my chart up here, I'd, I'd give a representation about that. And then there's a certain natural reality if I were to put over here masculine and I were to put over here feminine, right? Do we need to find masculine and feminine? Right? We, we all kind of know what that is, I hope. Maybe not, though. But masculine being uh, demonstrating the most kind of masculine kind of traits in regard to the male body. Feminine, of course, would be the greatest attribution of feminine traits on the other side. And all of us live somewhere on that spectrum and it may vary where we are. There may be one woman, and there are uh, women who differ on, on how feminine they are. Some women lean more toward femininity, some lean more toward masculinity. Men, it's the same thing. But there's still a difference. And I think his point is you need to demonstrate that difference. Just maybe because you have a leaning toward one or the other, you should strive to be what God created us to be and to behave in, as such. Um, and, and, and so I think that's, that's God speaking to us. Is, so does God have an expectation? Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, he created us a certain way, and he he expects us to live toward that nature. Um, so are people born with a tendency to be one or the other? So, I'm not a scientist. I've read some research on it, uh, but you know, like I mentioned, there there are some women who are more masculine than others, or some men who are more 
lean more toward femininity than others, lean further to the opposite side, I should say. But there still is a dimorphic difference between, between men and women. Um, so, um, so it's a little more complicated issue, but even if, so in other words, if I put it, let me wait, I'm going to save that because I'm getting ahead of myself. We'll get into the practical side of it, and I'll, I'll, we'll dive into those kind of questions. I think those are good, but let me deal with the biblical principles first, and then we'll, we'll deal with Becky. Well, I would say that God has defined sin. God said, you, want, you know, homosexuality, it's wrong. It's sin. It's wrong to pretend to be something that you're anatomically not. So if you say that James, if you look at James, you know, you sin because you want to, right? So God's defined sin, and James says that um, every man is tempted. You know, you're going to have your temptations, I'm going to have my temptations, but I'm drawn away of my own lust, of my own desires. So you might be drawn away by something that's different than what I'm going to be drawn away from. And you know, this year I might struggle with some sin more than I might struggle with a different sin in five years. So sin is clearly defined. We all have our own lust, and it's up to you what choice you make. Yeah. Yeah, and, and so just from a biblical standpoint here, um, let me just ask a practical question in here just about the biblical side of this. Without, <laughs> I know. It's hard to weed these, weigh these waters perfectly, but, but so biblical principle is, if let's say I'm a man who is more leaned more toward the feminine side of the spectrum, I'm not as masculine as some other men. There's nothing sinful about that necessarily, but does that mean I should? I should start wearing a dress and surgically change my physical flesh to meet what I desire to be more feminine. Where does the sin come? When you stop fulfilling your godly duties as a man. Okay. That's what I would say. And then when you start physically changing your appearance and following that. Yeah. Uh, if you're a, if you're a lady who who has some more masculine traits, um, is there anything wrong with a woman wearing blue jeans and a t-shirt? Nothing wrong with that. That's fine. Should a woman start to grow a beard? Mm. Most of them aren't able to. <laughs> should 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 I begin to change my physical form in order to try to represent myself as something I'm not? I think that's where. The it's not easy. That's it's kind of a cloudy, muddy subject in some ways, but but it's when I begin to try to alter what God had set in place. Um, because your woman doesn't necessarily mean I don't think that you have to wear a dress all the time, ever if you really want to. But are you trying to represent yourself as a man? Right? And that that's that's where the problem comes. Patrick. I mean, another reason that it's important not just because of you should stay assigned to whatever you were assigned. There's God, it, it's important that there's males and females because God has specific roles for males and females. Mm -hmm. So I mean even I mean beyond the physical pieces of it, he has roles in homes, he has roles in the church, he has roles in I mean there's all kinds of things that he has set around gender. And, uh, and there's a lot of men who don't like like it. And there's a lot of women who don't like it. I mean, there's a lot of men who would prefer not to have some of the things that God is asking them to do. There's a lot of men who would prefer not to be uh, responsible for things that go on at home. There'd be a lot of men who would prefer not to get up in front of people or not... <clears throat> so to cloud all that and to change that around, now you're, you know, so it's not just the fact of a convenience or something that you like. One of the reasons it is for God is he, he he's 
set you up with responsibilities based on who he created you as, whether you like it or not. It's mm -hmm. about submission to him. Absolutely. But you also find that when a person tries to attempt to change their gender, they're actually fighting against God. God's the one that made them male or female. And for them to reject God's order is to reject God and take it upon themselves to be the wrong God. I feel like I'm a woman, so therefore I'll dress like a woman and I ought to be respected for that. Well, mm -hmm. God doesn't respect that. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I want to come back to these issues and talk about them in a more practical way about our home and, and the church and personally, how do we deal with them after we talk about a couple other things. But from a biblical standpoint, gender is not fluid. God established gender from the beginning. There's male and female. And any kind of alteration on that is an alteration on the created order. Does God have an expectation of men and women? Absolutely. And, um, and, and so, um, and the way they represent their gender as well. So, um, so you think about transgenderism, and, and, and before that, the issue was homosexuality. Right, so I think one thing you'll notice as we go on through these is, what do all these really attack on? Well, they really attack on creation and an attack on God. Um, does Satan care whether I am transgender or not? Does, God, does he have a care about anything to do with our sexuality? He doesn't care. He only cares about it as a means to an end. His ultimate goal is to attack God. And so he'll use anything in culture or personal lives to attack that end. That's his thing. And, and so uh, I like in all of these issues to kind of look at it from a back up just a minute and to see what his ultimate goal is. What's he driving at? And so I think as we move through these, uh, hopefully we'll, we'll see that from that macro level, from that above level, what, what, what is Satan really doing? He's attacking God through all of these things. And he's using us to do it. So let's go to uh, uh, talking about this idea of homosexuality. Um, uh, as I mentioned, this has become, uh, it's almost, uh, I don't know, in, in my understanding of general population now, um, we've gotten to such an acceptance of homosexuality and homosexual marriage and all the things underlying it that it's almost moved beyond that. You don't even hear people talk about that as much anymore um, because now I believe the recent polls have been um, around 60 to 65 percent of the American population who agree that homosexuality is, is okay and that they should be able to marry Well, um, is that the way the Bible views these things? It's good to remind ourselves of this. So what about from an Old Testament perspective? Um, I was recently listening to a um, debate video on this issue and on the individual who claims to be a Christian, who uh, claims to be a member of Christ's church, talked about how homosexuality, there's nothing wrong with it, and went as far as to say there's really nothing in the Old Testament to, uh, to say anything to the contrary. Well, uh, I'm not going to take anybody's word for it. Don't take my word for it. Um, let's look and see what the Bible says. And so uh, I want to note again uh, Leviticus 18. I'm going to spend a look here for a couple of verses. What did God say in the law? Um, Leviticus 18, 22. Um, Leviticus 18, 22. You shall not lie with a male as with a woman. It is what? An abomination. Again, that term uh, is a little more forceful, a lot more forceful than just transgression. Um, again, uh, note, just a couple of chapters later, Leviticus 20, 13. 
If a man lies with a male as with a woman, both of them have what? Committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood is upon them. Um, what was the penalty for homosexuality? Well, it was death. They were to be stoned. They were taken out of the camp and to be stoned. He again calls it an abomination. And uh, he says their blood is upon them. In other words, what he's saying is their guilt um, is upon themselves. They can't blame anyone else. Um, so you would not be guilty in stoning them under the law of Moses. That was the law of Moses. Well, we also have a, examples in the Old Testament where, where, where this sin is called out. Of course, Genesis 18, Genesis 18 and 19 Again, we are reading, this is prior to the law of Moses. How did God view it prior to the law of Moses? Uh, Genesis 18 and verse 20, what's going on here? The angels have come to Abraham, and they have told them, number one, that Abraham and Sarai are going to uh, have a child, and that they are here to go on to Sodom and Gomorrah for what purpose? Notice verse 20, Genesis 18, 20. Then the Lord said, notice that, the Lord said, because the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great and their sin very grave, I will go down to see whether they have done altogether according to the outcry that has come to me. If not, I will know. All right, so God is sending his people to find out the true depths of, of what's going on. Go a chapter later, they do go on to, to Sodom and Gomorrah. Um, verse 4, 19, 4, But before they lay down, the men of the city, the men of Sodom, both young and old. What's important about that? Everybody is a big problem in Sodom. <clears throat> This is young, old. This isn't one particular group or another. It's young, old. All the people to the last man. He's really emphasizing that, isn't he? Surrounded the house and they called to Lot, where are the men who came to you tonight? That's these angels. They know they're angels. He's, they go on to cry out, bring them out to us that we may know them. It's found in Genesis chapter uh, 3 uh, when uh, Eve, Adam knew Eve and they begot um, Cain and Abel. Um, they want to know them. This is of a sexual nature. Um, later on, um, we find out that that, that very thing happened. Um, verse 23 tells us, the sun had risen on the earth when Lot came to Zohor. Then the Lord rained on Sodom and Gomorrah, sulfur and fire, from the Lord out of heaven. And he overthrew those cities and all the valley of the inhabitants of the city and what grew on the ground. But Lot's wife behind him looked back and she became a pillar of salt. And Abraham went early in the morning to the place where he had stood before the Lord, and he looked down toward Sodom and Gomorrah and toward all the land of the valley, and he looked, and behold, the smoke of the land went up like the smoke of a furnace. Very kind of vivid scene is painted here, very graphic. Um, God does not often act like this, um, Trying to think. Is there another time in all of Scripture when God destroys an entire city? Not, not something we see very often. Um, so when God acts like this, we should take note of that. Harry? I'm finding it interesting in reading through the Bible how often there's a reference to Sodom and Gomorrah. A lot of them. So we won't take time to do that now. No, but you're right. That's one of the things I, I have noted as well. There are a lot. And, and I want to go to one such in Jude 1-7 in just a minute. So 
some have come to this passage and they who want to support homosexuality and and talk about why this must not be against homosexuality and 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 some of the points have differed um, some say Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed not because of homosexual uh, uh, relationships necessarily but because of uh, of of the unhospitality nature of these people that they were not uh, um, because of their attitude toward these men in wanting to basically you know I have to throw this term out there it's kind of a rough term I know but to rape them and that this is really uh, about about that well is that what's going on? Well, I think Jude gives us um, a little bit of clarity on this in Jude one seven. Jude one seven, one of those mentions that Harry brought up. Um, what does Jude have to say? Jude one seven. Just as Sodom and Gomorrah. In the surrounding cities, all right, so this is a widespread problem. He's bringing up kind of examples in this, talking about sin and, and, and how God has punished sin. Notice what he says. Which likewise indulged in what? Sexual immorality. Well, is he just talking about rape there, forcible rape? Well, go on and read the rest of it. And pursued what? Strange flesh. Now the English standard has has the uh, has it translated that they pursued unnatural desire, uh, desire. Probably strange flesh is maybe a little better translation of that terminology. There, uh, they serve as an example by undergoing the punishment of eternal fire. But what was their sin? Strange flesh, right? That idea of they were pursuing something that was unnatural uh, is is not like other sin, but was unnatural uh, in in their pursuit. Roger. Yeah, I find it interesting that you know he could God could have just struck him dead, and you know they could have walked out of the city or mm. done whatever, but. Did it dramatically, you know. And um, my understanding is, for a thousand, you know, for at least a thousand years, you can see the scar on the earth where God bombed the place, basically. Yeah, um, that's a good point. And uh, you know, God has sent plagues among people because of their sin. He's sent snakes, even. He's done various everything. He sent different countries and invaded and destroyed lands. He, he used the Israelites to destroy the the sin um, that those people of the promised land who were who their sin had reached a certain level. And God said it's time to go. And um, but here God does something a little differently, kind of akin to the flood, where where he his his hand is so heavy in this moment that, like Roger mentioned, he leaves a scar on the earth. And, and so I, I think it's something for us to remember. But, but uh, Jude, Jude indicates that this wasn't about how nice they were or unnice. It was not about rape. Those things are wrong and shouldn't do them. Obviously, they're, they're evil. Um, but... but it, it is what they went after. It was how they behaved sexually uh, that, that is condemned. Uh, so kind of an Old Testament view. Next week we'll go on and look at the New Testament and what does it have to say about the God's view of homosexuality um, and, and, and what, what are his uh, desires in that regard. We'll uh, pick back up next week. Thank you again so much for your comments and attention. Look forward to worship and just. A